So hey everybody, welcome back to the Brand Muse interview series. I'm here with Steph Hammerlink today. Hi. And uh, <laughs> Steph is a uh, brand designer turned strategist and he's the host of the Let's Talk Branding podcast, which is where I came across him. And he interviews their industry leaders about branding, but he also co-founded an agency called Ali, which is a brand experience studio in Belgium. And he's on a mission to help creatives and marketers and entrepreneurs solve bigger problems. So with that, welcome, Steph. Welcome. Well, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. This looks uh, really interesting to do. <laughs> well, I've been totally, as I was saying before we went uh, live, I've been totally excited by your podcast because it's very rare that you come across a podcast that is really dealing with the more kind of esoteric and intellectual aspects of branding and brand strategy. And you have been really successful in landing some pretty amazing um, leaders in this space and having some really great conversations that I've been very inspired by. So I'd, I'd love to hear about why you decided to launch a podcast and what the motivation behind that was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first, thank you for listening and saying those words. I, I really appreciate that because it was like when I started this this whole journey for the podcast, I had like no idea if this was going to work out or what exactly it was for. But I was in this like phase of my life where I was I was doing a lot of design, but I was also learning a lot more about strategy. And I was thinking about like all these things, like doing workshops, but I didn't find a lot of material out there that were really talked about the brand strategies part, especially not from like a more designer creative standpoint. There's a lot of content when it comes to marketing, but not a lot of content coming from like designers becoming strategists and how to define a brand and so on. So I, I wanted to just start learning about the strategy and start talking to these people to these heroes i have I, I read like the books from marty newmeyer and i love marty of course so i just decided let's do this on a podcast let's invite all these people and start learning from them and start like seeing what the different opinions are and how i can actually try to take that to my day job in, in the studio and actually try to implement that and it really started growing, growing, and, and I tried to have like different topics, but it's, yeah, it's been really interesting for me. It's been an awesome journey so far, and I don't know where this is headed, but it's just so cool to, to be able to talk to all these people. That's just amazing. So when you call yourself a brand designer turned strategist, there's obviously an evolution there, and that's something I actually talk a lot about on, on my YouTube channel and on my podcast is that, um, you know, we have to up our game as creative professionals these days because of the commoditization that's going on in the creative space globally. And I'd love to hear about your transition and going from a brand designer to strategy and adding on that skill set. Why did mm -hmm. you do it and what's it been like? Yeah, well, it was interesting. I do think it was kind of like this natural evolution because I was always this person, even when I was doing design, I was always asking these annoying questions to, to clients like, but why would you really need this? And maybe, and what's the story behind it? I, I kind of felt frustrated just doing design. That's maybe just because I'm wired this way. I, I love to, I love reading about philosophy and, and all this stuff. So I do have a tendency towards this meta level. So that was something that was there. And then we had like this agency it was called Cloud Studio back in the days. It was this typical your average full service agency. We did everything, we were really cheap and we just tried to hustle our way through these projects and there were all these typical problems with clients trying to direct us, typical frustrations out about not being able to, to have clients that trust you and do stuff that's really cool. It was always like this frustrating train of endless project work where we really didn't have the impact we wanted. And then I started doing this one thing, what's, I call it story sessions back in the day. I think that was the hype of storytelling right then, a couple of years ago. And then these story sessions, we saw like how clients actually, they really loved that. And they, they were like, yeah, you're really helping me on another level. And we're really talking about this story, about this brand. And I really saw, okay, there's something here that's super important. And, and because we did that story, we also had a lot more impact. We, they wanted us to help them create the full brand and not just what they came for us. Like say, I want a website. And then all of a sudden we're doing this whole story and then they see, yeah, okay, we want you for all the rest. So 
this grew in, a, in about a couple of years. This, this shifted where we really saw the value of this more strategic approach. And then at a certain point, we just said like, okay, we need to rebrand the studio. We need to dump all of this. Like we did everything. So we, we tried to like reposition it, rename it. And, and it was just more of a, like a boutique design and strategy, strategy studio. So that's what we did. We named it Oli and we completely shifted. Also, we said bye bye to a lot of clients. I mean, mm. it was really like a, a risky move, but we really felt there was a different path for us. And for me specifically, my role was really this, this whole strategy where I felt like I wanted to define the brand on a higher level and really have clients trust me in building this brand. And that's where I really just, I started learning more about business and how markets work and how marketing works and, and how you need to do all this stuff, define a brand. And, and that's what, what the company became. And my role within that company was more, today is more of a strategist role where I still do a lot of, I'm still like in the, dilemma i'm still fighting with myself because i still love design i mean i still do some identity work from time to time and i don't want to be like estranged from that world because i think it's important to have those but i do feel like where the big passion is for me and where my strengths lie is more in that strategy role and i also am maybe i'm just not a good designer that's also possible <laughs> i don't know <laughs> so did, have you did you find it necessary to rebrand your studio in order to and shed clients in order to kind of sell in that higher level strategy leading up to design work? Were you did you feel like you were unable to kind of make that transition within your old agency? You had to rebrand yourselves in order to say, look, we're always going to talk strategy first rather than just jumping into website design or identity design. Yeah, that was like I think part of that was probably just uh, us as a team like being a bit biased about the old brand how how this often goes like we're just sick of this old brand and this reputation we have as this mm. typical small studio where you can just ask anything so we wanted to shed that like that that old shell and that's like part of the motivation but i do feel like the new positioning and how we change the company does attract a different type of clients because it was a lot more like it wasn't so accessible it wasn't so friendly it's a bit more bold it's not like it's a high-end studio or anything but we do try to make it look a bit more like you already need a really a, a passion for branding and doing something different in your category and that's why we attract a certain type of clients and not just everyone out there because you we kind of wanted to build in this filter that stops a certain amount of type of clients and that's why we did the rebrand just like right. having a, a baseline so when you you know when any designer is starts their own agency whether they you know it's a partnership or their own um you know agency name there's also a level of personal identification that goes with being part of the agency so you've started a podcast let's talk branding that's branded under your, your name not your mm -hmm. agency name and so was that a conscious decision to make it not from Ali, but make it under your name? How do you separate the Steph Hammerlink brand from the Ali brand? Or do you even think about it that way? It's it's tricky. I mean, I just started this as like a, a side journey, something after hours, and it kind of evolved. And I, I do see today like there's some... A lot, a lot more overlap happening where like clients are starting to listen to the podcast and there's some some like synergies going on which is interesting because it wasn't originally something where we said like from the agency we're gonna create this podcast it was more just me going on a tangent and today that's something actually like right i just came from this workshop where we actually were thinking about how we're going to fit in this personal brand with this let's talk branding and it's it's still a work in progress i mean there's definitely a lot of synergy going on i mean it's it's some kind of proof as well for clients that you have this podcast and all of these things going on but i don't i'm not there yet in terms of like how does do they overlap and where's like maybe could we have done it differently probably but it's 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 an interesting ride to see how it evolves so was are you using the Let's Talk Branding podcast as a content marketing vehicle to drive business to Ali? Or is it just driving business to you and then you you are part of Ali, so that's where you shovel it? Yeah, it's it's 
the the original idea for let's talk branding was a lot more about me also thinking about like besides doing this service work i wanted to create something a little bit more scalable and more like my own thoughts on branding and so i have these courses and all of this stuff so that's more of the the business level of let's talk branding but there's more of like this 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 thing that happens it's like overspill where there is of course some kind of synergy going on but it's not consciously where i'm driving leads towards ollie that's not really the case do you do any other kind of you say you have courses what other kind of um content marketing or um products digital products do you have for yourself mm -hmm. well on let's talk branding like the main thing is of course the podcast that's that's the the big channel and then there's all of these social media hanging around that like linkedin i do a lot of just like small more opin opinionated pieces um, I also have a YouTube channel, but that's something that's like in the fridge, so <laughs> don't go look at it. <laughs> and then I have these, I have these courses. I of course have the website where I do a lot of blogging, uh, and I do some like I, I did some small eBooks and stuff. But it's mainly like the podcast is the main channel, and then the courses is like the main uh, business around that. Cool. So where would you say your, you know, what do you love most? What are you most inspired by? Hmm, it's a good question. I think I get really excited by first off, like just talking to these people that challenge me on a, on an intellectual level. That's like something where I get really excited about, where I feel like I'm not quite grasping it yet, but I can feel something changing in my mind. Like I just had this podcast with uh, JP Hansen, and he was talking about strategy on like this more business corporate level. And I felt like these, all of these lightning bolts going through me, like, oh, my God, there's another level. We've just unlocked this whole new world. So that's where I get really excited about just reading books and unlocking new knowledge. And then the other part is really working with clients and really like finding this direction that's really, that has a great potential and developing that and seeing that come to life into a, a real brand. That's something I get super excited about. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've done in my agency, I having I had a long corporate and global agency career, and I I I've done a lot of branding and strategy for the huge corporations, you know, the Chevrons huh. and PepsiCo's and stuff like that. And when I started my own agency, I kind of took the, those methodologies and those practices of strategy and branding and scaled it to the point where small to medium sized businesses and entrepreneurs can use them. Because the fundamentals of branding are the same. It's just a question of scale or how deeply you can go into it or afford to go into it. Um, but so do you find that you are, you know, in the learning that you're doing in Let's Talk Branding and all your other, you know, courses and, and seminars and conferences that you go to, are you incorporating that into your practice in how you evolve what you're offering? For sure. It's, it's crazy how, like... I think what I was doing in strategy six months ago for my clients, what I'm doing today is completely different and is based on on what I've took from these books, what I've took from these guests, uh, like what I've learned. It's not like that I'm just gonna, I listen to one episode and I say like, we need to throw the whole thing around. I mean, I have like this base framework where I work around, but a lot of like things do change and I, I use like real work where I try to implement and I try to see what works. Or I, maybe it's a new exercise. Maybe it's a new kind of definition for a brand. I, I try all these things in real life and I just see what sticks. And that's really interesting to do because then you, you, it's not like you have this one singular framework where you always just go and do all of the check boxes. It's really this ongoing evolutionary thing. And that's what really works for me. It's not that easy because it's it's sometimes a lot more easier to just have like, this is the framework and this is what we do all of the time. But for me, it works because I can feel it going. I can feel the value for clients. So as long as that keeps happening, I think that's okay. I think, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's totally okay. And I think that, you know, there's always like the process, the suite of tools that, you know, you can go through mm -hmm. when you, when you, you know, sell in a project. But the thing is, is that most clients don't need all of them, right? They ne may need, mm -hmm. you know, this one or that one or two or three or whatever, and then not this other piece. There's also what they can afford too. But oh, I yeah. think also as brand specialists going in and auditing 
what their problem is, what the best solution is, and then architecting that solution, that strategic solution, is what they come to us for, right? So it's not always like a cookie cutter. So I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, it needs to be appropriate. And sometimes, like, it's 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 about what don't we know yet and that can be like that they're they already know a lot of stuff and you don't always have to go back and challenge everything they know of course you need to be aware of like what are assumptions and what is something that's really validated already and i don't need to question that so that's a bit of like a, a searching in this for in this first phase where you do workshops and you kind of feel like okay so this is really an assumption we need to test that before we build a brand on top of that but on the other hand, you don't need to start questioning everything. And that's, again, like the, the levels of strategy where you do have, for example, business strategy and someone has validated their business model and this whole idea. You don't need to go back and question like the whole business model. You need to build a brand on top of that. And I think that's where some people are getting a bit confused in like they're learning about all these different levels through each other and sometimes they forget on what level they are and they start messing with the business model because it doesn't fit the brand mm. but it's becoming a bit wishy-washy and that's dangerous for you it's dangerous for your clients so i do need to think like i think we need to be aware of what level we're on and like what are the expectations of our clients and work our strategy through that i think my strategy work has evolved from this more like being at the end of a of a brand strategy where i really made the bridge towards cr a design a creative design where i interpreted like what they saw as a brand and and made it something visual towards now i'm laddering up towards this more business level where i do start to think about is this the right distribution strategy is this the right way forward are these the right mechanics and then you need to be aware that you're talking on that level and also your client needs to give you permission to be on mm. that level of course yeah absolutely i think that that's really key is and their expectation of what they're going to be getting from you because you yeah. can't a lot of clients do want the executional they do want you know the logo mm -hmm. of the website the content marketing plan they don't want to like go back and look at customer avatars or think about their brand positioning or anything like that so i think that you do definitely need to have that kind of permission so how do you how do you get clients huh. we don't no it's not true <laughs> no do they all i mean is it word of mouth at this point do they all come yeah. to you is it you know from your past reputation what's your business it's, lead development look like you you're talking only now either you or Oli. well yeah it, well i think for let's talk branding it's it's definitely the podcast it's like uh, i think that's where a lot of like people listening transfer to buying my courses so that's i think the the most prominent way of generating leads and then just i think as always like in in this type of brand where it's really about content it's just about generating a lot of value through articles and helping people and being out there and doing talks all of this stuff thought leadership whatever we want to call it that's what generates leads to like my my personal brand and and, and let's start running for Oli, it's definitely been more word of mouth but we do feel like right now we're working on this more layer on top of that where, where we don't want to do a little bit more talks and boot camps and events and stuff that's really more again about thought leadership on how to do strategy and how to create a brand experience because we do feel like at a certain point when you're really at another level in terms of pricing and how you want to affect the business, it's not always the best thing to have like this network where there's a lot of like a little bit more low value clients or they don't have these budgets or they're already in a different stage. So that's something we're, we're working on right now. That's why we also like just like started to rebrand rebrand a little bit i mean we we started calling ourselves a brand experience studio and we really want to own that part and create some thought leadership about that so that's but mainly like if you would divide it right now today it's probably going to be 70 percent word of mouth 30 percent just through online uh, awareness and and like for example my colleague jill he's a really great designer and he has like a huge amount of followers on dribble so that's also where a lot of like more talent hunters and people from agencies or in-house are looking for talent and then they find him and then they come to us so that's also a, a big part of it so okay so your partner has kind of a personal brand going as well so they both they both end up kind of filtering in yeah well it's a it's a we're a four four people four. team and okay. one of the designers is a, like he has a really big personal brand as well yeah 
Okay. Um, so you see, you mentioned that you have video courses. How did you decide what courses to do? <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I thought like, what what course would I need? Like, would I need when I was here like six months ago? What would have benefited me to become like this? first layer brand strategist where i just understand like the questions i need to ask like how to do a workshop this really this this just initial thing and that's why i thought like i just need a course around i I call it activating your strategic brain it's just like opening these doors to what strategy is and just understanding brand strategy at its most basic core that's what i wanted to create and that's what my first course was about and and then I just broke it down into smaller courses about how to do a workshop and stuff like that. But I really like that was interesting to me to create a course while I was learning because it was kind of like um, I was just around the corner. Like I just learned this stuff and mm-hmm. I'm or I'm processing it and I'm bundling it and I'm making. And that's actually like the best way for yourself to really internalize what you've learned because you you need to make it like comprehensible for somebody else. And so this course, even like if it didn't have the huge sales impact or whatever, it still was super valuable for me just in terms of like writing stuff down that I understood. And if I can look back at it now, I see what I've already learned. And, and that's really interesting. And I didn't, I don't, I'm doing a lot of coaching with like the people that done that have bought my course. And that's really cool because they start evolving and they start going through this level where they're doing a lot more higher end stuff. And it's really fun to see, like, they're always just behind me. Well, not behind me, but I mean, they're just learning behind me what I've been learning right now. So it's really interesting. I think that's a really great point that you bring up too. And I think that that's really, really important for people who are just starting off and not, you know, later in their careers, like you or I to, to remember and think about, because I, when I talk about content marketing, people, a lot of them say, you know, I'm just starting off. I don't really know that much, or I don't have anything to share. I don't, you know, can't do content marketing. And I'm like, if you are out of junior high school and you've learned how to use illustrator, you've learned, you know, the basics of typography or, you know, you have something to share. Like there's always Mm -hmm. someone who's a step or two behind you and who's looking for someone like you to teach them what you just learned. And I think that's a really key key thing that you say, because not everybody is, you know, at the advanced level where they're just behind me or they're just behind you. It's like, they're, they're people who are just, I got to tell you this one real (laughs) quick story on my YouTube channel. You know, you can never tell who's, I get a lot of comments on my YouTube channel and you can never tell, you know, who people are on the internet, right? Mm-hmm. So this person asked this really interesting question about becoming a creative director. I really want to become a creative director. I've been learning Illustrator and Photoshop, and you know, I'm thinking about brand strategy. And I'm like, and and they asked me a question, so I answered it. And I say, you know, you don't really start off as a creative director. You have to work mm-hmm. your way up. You know, it's and you gather all these skill sets along the way, and blah 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 blah. And so you know tell me about your work situation. I asked them back and, and the final, the final response was, well, I'm only 12. So I'm just beginning <laughs> to think about it. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> number one, I was just amazed at how incredibly articulate this person was at 12. But I was just like that, you know, that goes to show you never know who you're talking to or who you're helping. And this person was like, I saw them all the time on my YouTube channel following my videos. And it's like, wow, some 12 year old is like getting some serious knowledge. <laughs> That's crazy. And, and yeah, if, if he starts like it, it reminds me of this guy, uh, Fred, Fred Brown, he's called like he he did, he reached out to me and he said, like, can we talk? And, and we did a little video conversation. And I think he was also 16 or 18. I might be wrong, but he's really young. And it was really interesting to me, like how he wanted to be out there and also started talking about his journey but he was of course he was a bit like doubting if he should do that but i told him like just go out there and and share what you want to share and it's really interesting because if i had have started when i was like 18 imagine where my brand or whatever my business would be right now i mean it would be a huge difference i think i started coming out of the closet it's a wrong metaphor but i mean like (laughs) only when i was like probably two years ago. So I said these 10 years, I was like in my office, just being quiet because I thought I had nothing to say. And now I 
experience this moment where I think like, damn, I have all of these things I want to share. And it's mm. like, once you open that door, it just yeah. <laughs> bubbles up. And why not start early? I mean, I do think one thing, one thing to note is be humble. I mean, I do see quite a bit of people on Instagram and LinkedIn sharing all of this content that one day probably just like a bit copied, like about like brand strategies, this and that. And I do feel like, hold on a little bit, like share the little things that, that you're sure of instead of like sharing the far away stuff that you still need to understand. That's my only like critical note towards like what you want to share when you're young is like be a little bit humble about what you know and don't be like the next Chris Doe immediately. I mean, you have time. Like that's my only side note on that. Well, I think that that's really admirable about how you're positioning yourself on your podcast is because you are really transparent that way and you are saying, look, and some of this stuff I'm just learning and I'm a recent convert to the power of strategy and I'm sharing what I'm learning as I'm going along and through these people I'm interviewing. So I, I find that super admirable. When you think about what the biggest challenges are for designers, creative professionals, you know, designpreneurs in the world today, what would you say are the biggest challenges for people right now in your opinion? Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest challenges is probably communicating our value and, and that's on different levels. I mean, a lot of people in design kind of understand strategy without knowing that they're doing strategy, but they, they like, they don't, first off, they don't see the value. And if they do see the value, it's not always that easy to translate that to clients. And I think right now we're in a space where a lot of like different fields, like marketing, for example, it's really about business objectives. It's about ROI. It's about KPIs. It's about all these things where it's really measurable. And brand is like one of those things that's, uh, I'm talking specifically about brand, of course, but creativity in general is like, it's a bit harder to measure and there are some things that are a bit more like soft or long term in what we do and communicating that value and realizing that value is really difficult because sometimes you float between like, yeah, I just did this, I don't know, this beautiful logo, but actually nobody cares. And then you float on the other hand, like I help this organization realize who they are and how they're going to be for the next five years. And that's huge. Like. And it can be like constantly floating in between those two. And that's partly imposter syndrome as being like this person that's not sure that you have the value. But then on the other hand, it's also your clients not seeing what your value is or understanding what it is. So I do think there is a lot of trouble originating in, in that part of the like what we face. So for someone who's having trouble with that in terms of um you know, their career and they're having trouble communicating to clients the, pa the the importance of what they do. One of the things you mentioned on a podcast I was just listening to this morning, actually, what was really interesting was um, you were talking about um, user research and and um, and the the uh, the ROI of of brand development. And one of the things you mentioned was the internal power that that has, how, uh -huh. you know, doing a brand redesign or redesign of collateral marketing materials or pitch decks or whatever can really motivate the internal staff, like the sales staff, the, you know, the rank and file of a company, not even just going like the customers or sales or, you know, anything that's real quantifiable, but something uh -huh. that's much more of a soft lift, so to speak inside of a company itself. I thought that was really interesting perspective. Yeah, that's that's like, and that's funny for me because I learned about, for example, value-based pricing. And I I think like a year ago, I went a bit overboard in the, ter in, in the sense that I felt like everything that was brand strategy or, or design related needed to be captured in return on investment business-wise financially. Like how much are we really pushing the bottom line here? And I still believe it's important to think about that. But what's really interesting to me is like I started taking a step back and seeing like there's these different circles of impact. And this this first circle is just like how you service your client, just like really basically like was he happy throughout this this service? That's mm. already value. I mean, you yeah, like you took down his stress levels. He was really happy doing this. He felt great. OK, second level, the organization. Like, how do they feel about this? Sometimes you can really see this when you're doing a rebrand 
and and like the logo is there the identity is there i've had like these presentations where there's there's whole company and you play this teaser with like cool music and everybody's like high-fiving and you you see like this is huge i mean it's not that often that these moments happen in a company i mean for a lot of people work is work it's nine to five blah 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 so that's like layer number two and then layer number three is like maybe it is about how customers perceive the brand and then maybe layer number four is like are we seeing an increase in sales are we seeing and then that's like if you see all of those circles like be happy with start at layer once go to layer two go to layer three but don't like immediately think about this logo should have like a 200 percent rise in sales i mean that's not gonna happen anyway so so like don't overestimate that part but also not underestimate just like the basics of it and that's indeed what like something that struck to me and even to build on that like things like positioning and all of these things we do in strategy we often like think again the end goal of positioning is that people understand the unique value of our business and the meaning behind the business but really what positioning at its most basic level is and i'm gonna steal this from jp who i had on the podcast was he said it's a time saver for a company i mean it's less discussions about where we want to go. It's less meetings. Less meetings saves you time, aligns the people. It's just like on the most basic level, if you can succeed in having a whole bunch of people having 50% less meetings because they all know what they want to do, that's like that's a the financial ROI is there. The the just like the happiness ROI of the culture of the company is there. So it's that's amazing. Like and then we can start thinking about positioning and, and how this in fa- impacts the whole brand. But like sometimes we forget these basic layers. It's really important. Yeah, I mean, and it's like marching orders. It's like if you have an army and you say cross this field, you know, if you don't line them up and put them in, you know, say follow the guy <laughs> in front of you and keep two feet between you and the next guy beside you, then you end up with like ants crawling all over the place, right? Because they wouldn't know how to do it. And that's very much, I think I agree with you, what branding is, is it's kind of creating a marching orders and, you know, creating lanes for people to go through. Because if you don't give them direction, internally I'm talking about sales staff, you know, anyone who's Uh talking about the brand, if you don't give them that kind of clarity, they will do whatever they think is right. And, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody has their own agendas, you know, from the salespeople to the marketing people to production people, and they'll talk about the brand in a different way. So creating that kind of clarity, you're right. I mean, it cuts off on duplicate work, you know, uh, channels crossing, um, you know, miscommunication, like you said, less meetings. I mean, all of that stuff. It's amazing. Yeah, and I do think like that's important because I think oftentimes designers were so trained in thinking about like empathy and thinking about the end user. I mean that that's huge. I mean that's super important. That's like Marty Newmeyer 101 where he says like a brand is a customer's gut feeling about a product or a brand. That's huge. But like if if the person in between you and the customer doesn't understand what feeling to communicate, then it won't matter. You can create the most amazing pitch deck, but then it just like, it falls flat because nobody really got it in the organization. So that's something I try to focus on. Like, is there a platform in this organization for understanding and really thriving on this, this whole brand essence or whatever you want to call it? Because if there's not, it's not going to matter how cool it sounds and how great customers might find it because it's not going to be communicated. So I do think we tend to skip one, one part of that sometimes. So here's one question, and I, and I gave you a heads up, so hopefully you were paying attention. That <laughs> It's a question I hit everybody that I interview with on my show, and that is, do you have a personal manifesto or some sort of mantra that you try to live your life by? <laughs> I saw that question and it's funny like um, I think six months ago I started thinking about this this idea of like what I wrote down about solve bigger problems mm-hmm. and I, it kind of resonated with me on especially on the professional level but it it also like resonates with how I think how I'm wired like I, I remember when I was a kid, I was always thinking about like these bigger, bigger things or like bigger worlds or so it does like I really like this idea because it's always also like I, that's how I look at life. I'm a real I think I'm an optimist. 
my wife tells me I am, so I, I think <laughs> I am. And, and it's funny, like, when there's a problem coming my way or, or when there's something negative, I always try to see, like, but is this really a problem or maybe there's something else or is it, it I don't see it as, like, a, a real problem because there is always something bigger. So in that way, it's, like, this optimism about, like, not being too afraid about how things are rolling or stressing out about what you're doing wrong or why you can't do more content or like it's always there's always this crazy pressure on everyone especially if you like you and me i think if you want to do a lot of content there's this pressure on you like i need to be gary v i need to be out there 24 7 going crazy and and like you need to make yourself at ease that okay come on there's bigger stuff to solve here but let, let's take it back a bit so maybe that is my personal mantra I, I it's more of like a definitely it's more of like a brand thing like for let's talk branding but i do see how it relates to my own thoughts oh i think that's awesome and i think it's actually kind of amusing that as an optimist your mantra is to think that there's a bigger problem <laughs> <laughs> well it, it makes your but it's solvable easier. that's the interesting thing yeah yeah and it's also, like, you know, being a married man, yes, we are defined by what our wives think of us. <laughs> <laughs> voilà. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, maybe so it is contradictory. I, I need to think about it. But no, I think it's like I, you know, there is always a bigger problem to solve, and that you can you can deal with that two ways. You can be like really afraid of what's coming, or you can tackle that challenge. And that's re really for me what it's about. Like you can stay at a certain level like for me it's like in in professionally when i see these business things it's like i'm a bit afraid but i'm also like i'm more excited to go and f go and find out what the, this thing is about and that's how i also tackle like if i'm i'm, I'm a like a big fan of skateboarding i'm not really good at it but i do want to like find out how to do the next thing constantly and and that's like part of who I am. And I think that's also part of why I really am so interested in strategy. So is that where Ollie came from? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Skateboard move. Ollie is like the, it's like, we had this idea. It's like the Ollie is the most essential trick in the book. But if you can't Ollie, you can't do anything else. And that's like what we see as doing strategy first. It's like you need to have this understanding. And then you can start doing 360 flips and kick flips and whatnot. That is a brilliant branding met metaphor. <laughs> and, and an awesome point to end on. So where can people find you? Um, you can find me at letstartbranding.be or .com. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Steph Hammerlink, my name. I couldn't get the handle for that. And then uh, LinkedIn, just my name. Um, you can email me at hello at letstartbranding.be. Uh, you can reach out. I also have a small Slack community if you want to talk a little bit more privately in like a smaller group. But uh, you can find all that stuff on letstartbranding.be. And yeah, listen to the podcast. I mean, if you do one thing, I think that's the best thing because that's where people that are a lot smarter than me solve bigger problems so <laughs> there you go back to the bigger problem solving well that's awesome steph steph hammerlink thank you so much for joining us really appreciate your taking the time to talk to us today thank you this was really f really fun i mean like i i'm used to being on the other side doing the interview <laughs> this was a bit stressful but it was really fun so thanks All a right, lot. great well thanks a lot we'll talk to you again hopefully i will bye, -bye. Right.